Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. This is going to be episode seven of our drawer making. We actually filmed episode seven yesterday, but we had problems with our, uh, wire, um, the mic was terrible. So we weren't able to post it. That's why I, sent, I gave you the one about uh, grinding, which hadn't been released before. And I was going to talk to you about that anyway. So it was timely. I want to show you this chest of drawers, different. Um, if you've ever seen any shaker furniture, this is patterned after a uh, toolbox that a father had made a son, and Chris Brexfoot has it in his book. Really liked it, thought it was neat. I like making drawers, in case you haven't figured that out. The, ma the mistake I made was, I, it was complicated, and I thought, well, I'll do it out of poplar first. If I like it, then I'll make another one out of something nicer. Should never have done that, because it was extremely complicated, and there was no way I was going to make two of them. And poplar is probably the most boring wood you could possibly find. Anyway, this has, I'm going to go through and show you this. This has been on our home for probably uh, 30 years. No. No? How long? You're only 26. And you remember it? So, 20 plus? Is that you that wrote all over these? Who was it? Rat right on them. Bo? No, it wasn't Bo. It was long before Bo. Anyway, um, I want to explain to you the case because the case is really complicated. And no, no, the paint cans don't come with it. It's actually mounted to the wall. Uh, so, the first problem we ran into when I brought it home was the kids were opening it up and the drawers ended up on the floor. So I had to go in and figure out a way to keep the drawers from falling out put in drawer stops after the fact, and this small as this is, it was a little bit difficult. So I'm going to uh, take these out, and I'll show you the casework, and then I'll talk to you about the rest of it and the drawers. The case is constructed using something called a through wedge tenon. Now, in case you're not familiar with that, we're actually doing those right now, and here's a deal for you. In our online workshop, um, of course, you know what the, I assume you know what that is because that's where this is being ba made. Our online workshop, we film three 45 minute episodes each day, each week, sorry. We've been doing it for nine years. So there's over 2,000, there might even be as many as 2,500 episodes on there because there was a time when we used to do five a week. Anyway, um, it's a membership site, but we're giving you a free month if you want to go in and try it and see. So what we're doing in there right now on the uh, standing desk is we're building this upright piece that will sit on top. I think you've seen it, but I'll show it to you just in case. It'll sit on top and it'll hold envelopes and paper and whatever else. So this will be dovetailed, this will be dovetailed. This one is gonna be through wedge tenon. So this is what a through wedge tenon is. You've seen that on there. So we're going through the process right now of cutting them. In fact, we just filmed it tonight. That episode got screwed up too. So Round two is tonight. So there's what you have to do. You have to uh, cut a mortise, which is a square rectangular hole through the wood, and then you have to slope the outside walls so that this is wider than this. That way when the piece comes through, you have a couple of cuts already made in it. You drive a contra uh, I prefer to use a contrasting colored wood, and that opens up those outside pieces from where you've made the cuts. The whole thing, the glue dries, and it becomes an internal dovetail. So if you want to see how that's done, just, what do they do? Go to the website, robcosman.com? No, how do, you, how do you join that? You have to get the newsletter. No, speak. You get it on a YouTube video. On a YouTube video. Oh yeah, so <laughs> look right up there, and that'll take you to it. I keep forgetting about that. Anyway, complicated. But the math in this was a bit of a nightmare because everything had to, uh, well, you'll see in a moment. And uh, I, may, I may as well tell you this little part first. So what I did to uh, prevent the drawers from getting pulled open and ending up on the floor, remember this was already built, I went in and I drilled a half inch diameter hole from the bottom right up through into the top to within about an eighth of an inch of the top. And then I merely put these little pieces of dowel with a washer on the top, and so it would sit on there, 
move it up like that to pull the drawer out and it would drop down in place. Because the drawer bottom rides above, it clears that quite easily. Now, how do we do the top one? Can't get up into here. So if you look up in there, you can't see it very well. But what I did is I took that same piece of half inch dowel, I drilled a hole in it, quarter of an inch in diameter. I put a, uh, and then, so if you can imagine drilling a quarter inch diameter hole in there. Actually, first thing I did is I went in and I drilled, I drilled this out. I drilled a hole about like that in there. And I went down about that deep. And then I drilled a quarter inch diameter hole in there. So there's a small dowel inside a bigger dowel with a little washer on the top of that small dowel that will allow it to do the same thing as this. Problem is there's just enough friction and that dowel was that wash, the washer was there for the weight to keep that down. And it wasn't heavy enough. And there was just enough friction that it stuck up in there. In fact, there's four, there's four of them and they're all stuck. Worked for a little while, but not for very long. Anyway, get past that. So when we built this, all of these pieces, anywhere it's not a dovetail, it's a through wedge tenon. So you've got one, two, three, three we through wedge tenons on each one of these joints. There's a total of 36 of these that had to be cut. And if you look at this and you figure out this has to, they can only go together one way. And I can't quite remember how we did it. Because that piece has to come on there. This outside piece has to come in like that. And that in itself was complicated because... When this piece went together, um, I think, I think these were, no, this would have had to gone together like that. So all of this had to been, would have had, would have had to been done at the same time. Two rows of dovetails and six through wedge tenons. And just having to, working in around this to get everything just the right length because, um, you know, this piece had to be the same length in order for this piece to fit in there properly and that piece to fit in there properly and it was a nightmare. Anyway, let's talk about the drawers. Uh, small, thin, mahogany. I use mahogany for the contrast, but you know what? You got to be really smart when you do that and I wasn't. So the mahogany and the end of the poplar when it ages with oil on it, it almost makes it so you can barely see that dovetail. I wish now I had to use a different wood to give a little more contrast. Now, this is a piece of the Poplar has, uh, it's green in the center, which is called the heartwood, and it's white on the outside called the sapwood. I probably should have used all heartwood and then it would have been, might have shown up a little bit better. Anyway, um, these drawers aren't so bad in terms of the size, but when you get into a long skinny drawer like this, not, not so much, it's, it's uh, wider than it is deep, you don't have a whole lot of reference to keep it from jamming. So you got to be right on the money. I don't think there's anything else more to tell you about that other than the fact that uh, it was kind of, I wasn't planning on keeping it and then I decided with so much work into it that I was going to keep it. And I went in and I added this cherry piece on after the fact to, uh, so I could attach it to the wall. And then over, over time, this has actually sagged. If you look really close, you can see a sag in the middle. So what I'm going to do is come in and I'm going to put, I'll put another piece of cherry on here and stretch it across and I'll purposely put a little crown in it so it'll put, give a little bit of support to that to get that back up there so it's not sagging. Live and learn. All right. So here's what we did yesterday that we filmed and uh, I wasn't able to show you because the video didn't show up. So we went in and we had to make this the exact same length as the drawer front. So what I did is I took the drawer front, I laid it on top of the drawer back, lining up the pieces. So I've got this labeled, sorry. I always label the outside. So this is top, uh, top right, top right. On the drawer back, it goes on the back. On the drawer front, it goes on the front. This is going to be planed off. So line those two up. Always, always registering on the bottom. That's the part that always gets referenced. And then I have a, a blade, a plane blade. Actually, I can't even remember where this came from. It was out of a specialty plane of some sort. And I didn't sell it and it was left over inventory when I was done 
representing Lee Nelson. But I kept this without a back bevel on it. So I could come in here if I was having to uh, scribe one piece off of another. If you have a back bevel and you lay it like that, the bevel, the, the uh, blade edge is not going to be right up against this because the back bevel is going to push it out some. This will allow me to make a very precise mark and it's wide enough, unlike a small narrow knife, that I can easily keep it referenced. And then what I do is I just tip it like this and I drag a corner through when I get out here because if you, you don't have any reference surface left if you continue to do that, when you get about to there, then you just turn around and go back the other way. And again, you've got lots of reference surface to lay up against there. And that ends up making that exactly precise. Then I went over to the shoot and I went over to the table saw and I cut close and then I went to the shooting board. Fortunately, or un 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 uncharacteristically, this piece, because these were already taken apart and shot, these edges are perfectly square. So all I had to do was go in and just use the shooting board and it just squared that up. And I took it right to the point where we just saw the last little half of the knife mark disappear. And now when you put these two pieces together, they are exactly the same. Now we set our marking gauge. Oh, one more thing we had to do. If you remember, I had forgotten to uh, cut my rabbit. So we decided, decided to do, show you how to do it on the table saw. And it's worth setting up again just to show you this. I use a, uh, I use a rip blade. And the reason is, let me just blow that dust away real quick. I'll blow it in the opposite direction. I use a rip blade because it cuts square on the bottom. MDF dust is miserable. Rip blade is square on the bottom. Now because the pieces are fairly tall and the fence is short, I put my sleeve on there and that gives me lots of reference surface. Slide that on. Now snug that up with all four toggles. Now you also, when you're doing this, you want to make sure that that fence is indeed square to the table. Reason is, the rabbit I'm going to cut on the inside edge, that, while lower than this, must remain parallel to it. Or else when you put the joint together, instead of it being, instead of it being square when it, when it registers, it would be off one way or the other, depending on how out of parallel that surface is. What, why did you take this off? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to take the uh, riving knife, splitter, whatever, off. <laughs> Want to make sure this is standing square. And it is, and if it was off any, the Biesmeyer fence, there's two little uh, bushings, well they're not bushings, they're nylon um, set, screws. set screws, yeah, big ones. And you just loosen one, tighten the other one so that you just tip it like this until you get that set up. Now what I did is brought the fence over. Oh, let me explain this part. You could do it one of two ways. If you do it this way, keeping your board between the blade and the fence, set it for the exact height you want, move the fence over. The problem is if you make a mistake, you're going to come in into the blade and you're going to take off more than you wanted. So you're always better off covering your blade. Now I'm sighting down there and I can only, I can see just a little bit of blade. And then what you can do with a scrap always, come in here, Run that across, adjust it accordingly, but if you make a mistake here, you're going away from the blade, not into it. That means the, that leaves a bump. Then you just have to go in and redo it. Whereas the other way, you remove material, now you got a problem. So we ran, and, and another reason, another advantage to having your marking gauge set to the same amount front and back is that these operations require one setting and you can do all four corners. 
And just to re remind you, what that ends up meaning is that your tails, because I typically like, somebody asked this question on YouTube, I like to have the back to be thinner than the drawer front. Don't ask me why, I just do. I don't like it to be the same thickness, a lot of most people do. I like that elongated tail pin, I just think that looks better. Don't want it to be as, as heavy as this, but I want it definitely thicker than the sides. It makes the joint even stronger, really, because it gives you more glue surface. Okay, understand that? So that's why you end up with that little bit of the construction detail, we'll call it. All right, what are we on to? I'm going to put this back. No, I can't. I've got to figure something out. Um, don't forget Saturday night, we're changing our, we're changing our uh, live workshop times to 6 o'clock Eastern. It works better for the folks in Europe. <laughs> and we're working on Angie's bed desk. Okay, set these aside. Now, we uh, went through and we cut all the rest of these. Trying to think of everything we did yesterday. And if you, uh, I don't know if I did this the day before or not, but when I cut my front tails, was this yesterday? No. No? You'd already done that. I had it cut down in there? You sure? All right. Okay, now it's time to mark them out. And I was going to start with the back, but I'm going to start with the front instead because there's an issue I have to deal with on the back. And I haven't figured out how to solve it yet. And I want to get this video posted for you today. So we're running short on time since it's already 20 after 10. So I'm going to take my drawer front. Every once in a while, I'll stop and just put all the pieces together. Just helps me get and stay oriented properly. Top right, top left. So there's my drawer. So I'm going to take this one. I'm going to work on the top right corner. I'm going to put my, this is my uh, drawer front. I'll refer to it as my pin board in the vise. And I want it to be flush with the top. Shoot, Jake, I didn't, uh, I didn't mark those. Oh, the end lap? Yeah. Mark that, and I forgot to do the other ones. So what we need to do is we need to know we need to have our end lap laid out. So I'm going to go back in and I'm going to reset my marking gauge. That's the nice thing about having a very precise marking gauge. I'm going to go in here and just set it right up against that that shoulder line that we already put on. Lock it down. And then this Referencing off of the inside, not the outside, I'll scribe and this will tell us where our end lap is going to be or how much of an end lap we've got. Okay, now we'll do that again. Top right, I'm going to put that in there so that it's flush with the top of the plane. Nah, come on. Set this back. Take my tailboard. Yeah, that flexes, so I'm going to have it right about there. Now I need my sawtooth blade. Now I've got to try to explain this to you and make it make sense. At the same time, I've it's it's getting a little bit ahead of where I want to be, but I've got to do it anyway. I've got to set my I always like to use I always like to do this on a metal surface so I can hear it nice and flat. I'm going to put my marking gauge so that it's referencing sitting only on the saw. It's not touching the plane, it's only on the saw. 
Then I'll loosen this up, and I like to be able to hear that. When I hear that drop down, I know I'm where I want to be. Snug this up. Now that takes into account, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the thickness of my saw plate, which is 20 thousandths of an inch, um, five times, five, thickness, five pieces of writing paper, which are about four thou each. The set, meaning these teeth on this, the, every other tooth is bent one to one side, one to the opposite, are two thou per side. So that means that that setting should be 24 thousandths of an inch, 20 plus two plus two. Now, what I'm going to do is I need, there's, there's, in case you don't know why, that little rabbit references these two pieces perfectly. Makes it so precise. What I need to do is go in there and I need to mark or transfer these marks onto the bottom piece. However, if I didn't do what I did, I would be starting my mark right about here because you'd only be able to get to the line, right? Now when it comes time to sawing, we're actually gonna take this board out, we're gonna turn it around, and we can only saw from that line to this line. And in starting the cut, you're having to guess where the kerf is because you weren't able to come all the way to the end. So what I discovered was that if you allow your, if you allow your saw, your, uh, not your saw. Yes, if you allow your saw to cut a little bit deep. Now, these are a little extreme. And if you notice over here, you barely see them. I mean, how many times are you looking this way in a drawer? You pull the drawer out, so it's not like it's going to be seen. But what that's going to allow, when I put my sawtooth blade in there, I'll be able to reach beyond, see that? Beyond the line and I'll be able to start my little kerf right out here. And we'll get that far so you'll see what, exactly what I mean. So put this in place. I always like to have extra light. Hopefully that doesn't screw up the camera too much. Now, uh, am I to assume that they understand this? Would they have seen this anywhere else? We haven't done it, have we? Well, if you haven't, if you've seen my other videos, you'd know this, but let's just uh, assume that you don't know. So what I'm going to do, and the reason why I didn't remove the waste, by the way, tell me how much time I have so I can kind of gauge. 23. We're at 23 minutes? Okay, so I'm, I'm fine. The advantage of this system is I could take my saw and I could put my saw right in that kerf and then drag it through, leaving a mark on the piece below. Now, Ernest Joyce, in his book, The Encyclopedia of Furniture Maker, back in, back in 1971, showed this method, but he didn't, he didn't offset it. He kept it flush. And he would take his saw, not a criticism, just explaining where my idea came from, and he would take his saw and he would put it down in the kerf like that, and he would drag it through each of those, leaving a mark exactly. You see, the way we used to do it is we'd remove the waste. And then you come in with a, uh, a sharp knife, something like this, and you would carefully trace each tail onto the pin board below. And the, the finer the mark, the more precise you could be. So you didn't want them to be too deep. Terribly hard to see. And then you've got to try to start the saw exactly in the right spot. The other problem with the way that method, that, that method was, because it was left flush here, you were actually marking in the pin. Here's what I mean. If I were to start sawing, right down through this line. When I put the joint together, this pin out here would be too small by the thickness of that one kerf. And if I were to saw right through this line and right through that line, when this pin, which is underneath on the piece of cherry comes up, it would be too thin by one kerf on one side and another kerf on the other side. Well, it's extremely problematic, can't do that. Ignoring that issue, after you've gone and made your marks, you still end up having knife marks in the pin because you now have to saw beside the pin in order to prevent making these too small by the thickness of a saw kerf. So two problems. You're trying to saw beside the kerf mark, which means your saw is going to want to fall into it. 
And number two, you have to ha leave enough material so that when you plane this clean, you can get rid of that mark you made. And that always bothered me. I came up with this idea back in uh, 2014 or 15 that if this mark is in the wrong spot, what do you have to do to get it in the right spot? Well, if making this, leaving this flush means that saw curve is going to take off part of this half pin, then what I need to do to get it in the right spot is simply move it over one saw curve. And now that mark is in the waist right beside this half pin. And the same is true for each of these. So what I do now is I measure my saw curve. I set this referencing the head of the tool, that's the brass piece, against the side of the tail pin board. Put this on, and this is where that little rabbit comes in so handy. Move that over until it touches. Now I have offset it effectively, the thickness of one saw curve to my left. So what that ends up meaning, and I'm going to put a T on these, the T stands for tail, and I'll circle it. So these are the pieces that I'm keeping. Everything else is going to be removed. So what I want to do now is go in and mark, if I moved my tail board, the white piece, to my left, I'm going to mark to the right side of each tail. This is a tail, so I'm going to go in here, and because I undercut in here, I'm able to reach right down in and get down into the face. Now, I'm going to anchor it with my thumb, because what I can't afford to do, I do not want to pull this through and leave a mark over here, leave a mark on my end lap. This cherry, this piece of cherry, this one included, are already at, this, at their length. I can't remove any material off of them or else I'm going to have a loose fit. So I've got to be so careful not to pull that sawtooth blade beyond that gauge line that I just made. Now I'm going to look really close. And I find that if I anchor with my thumb... I can get a little more control. I'm watching to see when the teeth are close to engaging. Uh, that should be close enough. So that was to the right of this one. Now I'm going to go in here and do the right of the next one. A little slower, but a lot more control when you're doing it this way. What I love about this system, now my dovetail marking knife, this, that little blade is exactly the same as my saw blade. So when I put it in here, it doesn't move side to side. It fits in there perfectly, which means there will be no slop in where my kerf is in relation to where it's supposed to be. I don't like doing that because in slamming it back this way, I'm af always afraid I'm going to move that tailboard, even though I'm holding it firmly with my left hand. Now, if these aren't deep enough, I can go back in and redo it. Okay, I'm going to lift this up and see. Okay, see the, yeah, here's an example. See how this comes all the way down? When I start sawing from this side, I will be able to set my saw right in that curve. Huge advantage. Now, don't be fooled. That's just a mark in the plane blade. This is my mark. I can, I can bring all of those closer, and I'm going to. It's just uh, the farther over you have that, the more accurate you'll be when you start your sawing. So I'm just putting it back into place. Hold it firmly. Make sure I'm in the right spot. <sighs> Better eyes. <sighs> now, you may be thinking, Rob, this takes too much time. Well, it's the end result I'm thinking about. Now that I no longer have to 
build furniture for a living and I can be afforded the time to do it the way I want, I still think you need to get it done. But I don't have to hurry in areas where it's going to make a difference. I'm watching those teeth really closely and make sure I don't go beyond that end lap. All right, I'm going to leave it at that. Now, we got to go the other way. Now, I'm often asked, well, why don't you just mark this, you know, do this one this way? Because you'll see why in a moment, why people would ask that. If there's any discrepancy in the width of these two pieces, it's going to throw it off, and there is. This one is narrower than this one. This has been fit to the opening. This hasn't yet. This has got to be a little bit removed to allow it to fit. So what I've got to do, and this is a large diameter cutter, so we sell, uh, we sell several different marking gauge cutters. If I could undo it. Why is that stuck? There's a really large diameter one, in case you have a hard time with this. I think we have how many different size cutters? Four? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to balance that cutter down below. A little difficult, but not terrible. Make sure there's no debris there. And this time I'm going to slide again. That little uh, rabbit is so advantageous. I'm going to slide it over until it touches the brass. So now I've offset the tailboard to my right by one saw kerf. That means I'm going to go in and I'm going to work on the left side. If I offset to the right, I'm going to go to the left side of the tail. So that's this one. Got to get a little more. Oh, you see? the next one the deeper that kerf there's another huge advantage you'll see when we go to cut them are we gonna get to cut them day mm -mm. no why are we already at 30 Two. all right last one we'll end with this one and then uh, we'll get all set up for tomorrow. No, not yet. All right, let's lift that off and see. Okay. Nice and clean. Get, can you get in real close on that? It's just the. Well, I, I get so excited about this because these are. This is exactly where you're going to put your saw. You don't have to guess. I need to be a little bit closer, a little farther away. No, right in that kerf, and then just finish the cut. And these knives are nice and clean and sharp. And the sharper those edges are the better the joint is because you get two sharp edges coming together, you get a perfect joint. All right, did I forget anything? So I'll put, I'm gonna put a link up there because I know you're gonna want it. I'm gonna put a link up there for the dovetail marking knife, the marking gauge. Throw another one up for the saw. Actually, we didn't use the saw today, just those two. Okay, well, um, if you have questions, put them in there. There's a lot of them, so we try to answer as many as we, as we can. And we will see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Stay healthy, be happy, see you.